Welcome everyone. Today on uh, the channel, I've got a special guest from England. His name is Mick Locke, and he's got a story about his friend Ian Jacobs, who died on Kotau on or about the 15th of January 2000, so over 21 years ago now. But he's uh, got a story about his highly suspicious death, which we both think was a, uh, a murder. So welcome to the channel, Mick. Hi. Hi. Uh, okay, well, would you like to start your story uh, perhaps back at the very beginning of January 2000 and we'll take it from there? Yeah, um, me and Ian were best friends, I suppose, living in Bristol at the time. Yes. Um, on the 3rd of January, I took him to Heathrow. He flew to Thailand to go and do a diving course on Koh Tao. I flew to India about two weeks later. Um, soon after arriving in India, I was heading up towards the Himalayas. I got an email from a mutual friend saying that he died, uh, saying that he'd been found at the bottom of a well and that he died from a blow to the head. I think that's the story we got at the time. Uh, there was, everybody assumed, all his friends, there, there were a big group of us mutual friends in Bristol that it was suspicious. There was never any doubt in our minds at the very beginning, it was, it was dodgy. So I then flew to Thailand to go to his cremation. Uh, he was cremated at the Temple of the Golden Buddha, very famous temple in Bangkok. There's uh -huh. a nice picture there. Yep. The largest golden Buddha in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I was there in Bangkok, I decided to go down to Koh Tao. Yes. Uh, this must have been probably, we're talking a couple of weeks now after he died. I guess. I can't remember the dates exactly. Yep. Uh, not to stir anything up, but I just wanted to see. I mean, my main concern, I think, was to see whether it was possible for someone to fall into this well accidentally, because, of course, none of us believed it. But I wanted to make sure. So that's what I did. Went to Koh Tao, only stayed there four or five days, I think. Um, was shown the well that we were told he died in, more of that later. Okay, who showed um, you the will? I can't remember. I, I honestly can't remember, it's 20 years ago. But was it the police or was it um, other people on the island? I don't think it was the police, I think it was other people on the island. Okay. I'm pretty sure. And there was some uh, discussion, because we've had, uh, we've exchanged uh, some tweets and some messages in the past, and sometimes the place of death has been referred to as a well. Sometimes it's been referred to as a um, prefabricated concrete pipe, but you think that, you know, maybe it was a well um, that was constructed of prefabricated concrete pipe. Is that the story? Yeah, I mean, this came, well, this is this is jumping forward because yes. okay. for 20 years, I believe that he was found at the bottom of a well with water yes. in it. Okay. Uh, in the space of the past year, I've spoken to someone, an eyewitness on the island, who saw his body the day it was found yeah. and says he was found in a, a, a disused well. A, yes. a, and the wells in Thailand are made out of concrete piping. I'll show you a photo here. Thanks. Concrete drainage channels, which are buried horizontally into the ground. Um, now, the eyewitness says there was no water in the well he was found in. In fact, it was full of mud and litter, almost up to ground level. It was only like a couple of foot, feet deep, basically. Whereas the well I was shown on the island was a deep well with water in the bottom. And for 20 years, I believe this was his place of death. And the police reports all say he was found at the bottom of a well with water in it. And mm -hmm. basically they found. Um, Anyway, so I went to look at this well, found the well, shown the well, decided it was pretty much impossible to either walk into it because it had the well had a lip and you would not be able to just walk into it. Nor if you stumbled over it, would you fall in it? You would fall across it. Uh, the, the, the aperture wasn't big enough for someone to trip and fall and fall down into the well. So any remaining suspicion that it might have been an accident was expelled from my mind. Um, there was no doubt you either jumped in the well or somebody put you in it. Okay. Um, I went to see the police while I was there. I, again, I didn't go in there, stir up any fuss. I was 
too scared really. Um, I asked what had happened to his money because I know he'd had money and when his possessions were returned, there was no money. They told me to, that the money had been used to transport his body to the mainland and that's why the police had kept the money. Um, and they asked me to return to see them in a couple of days time when the chief of police who carried out the investigation, um, the chief of police from the Copan gang, the neighboring island would be there. I returned uh, to the police station. On the way, I went to take some photos of the, the well, the scene of the crime, only to discover the whole area had been completely bulldozed. Um, there was no well to be found. It was okay. When, when you say it was bulldozed, um, are there? It was a bulldozer, but there was no well. Okay. The whole landscape had been filled in. It was been filled in. And yeah. you know, you can see something had been going on. Okay. Now, you didn't actually possible. see a bulldozer, though, did you? It was no, a, no, I didn't. You saw, saw the um, It was my impression was that they destroyed the scene of the crime. Yeah. Okay. Um, although, to be fair, if the body is found in a well, you wouldn't want people drinking from it, so you would no. probably fill it in. But yeah. um, yeah. it was suspicious to me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, then I went to see the police, um, and the chief of police from Copan Gang. Yeah, I can't remember the course of the conversation, but. The only one thing I do remember him saying to me is there is a boat leaving in the morning. You should be on it. Yes. Um, which I took as a, a not very veiled threat. Uh, yeah. It was enough to put the, put the willies up me quite, yes. quite severely. And I think I did leave the next day. Um, and do you have any theories of your own or uh, any reason uh, for any motive for someone, anyone to kill him? No, I don't. I really don't. Um, it could have been a mugging. I mean, I had my suspicions early on. I'm not going to go into them because I don't okay. know. At the time, there was a story about him lending to money to someone on the island who was setting up a bar. Um, and we thought possibly this guy had, had done him in, but I don't think that's okay. very feasible. I think the chances are he was very, he, when he got drunk, he was very cheeky. Um, it's very possible that he was cheeky to someone in the bar that mm. night. And you know how ties are with the idea of face. Yes. Who knows? Yes. I mean, we know we know now know that there's some pretty psychopathic people on that island. Yes. So who knows what happens? He might have been mugged. Yes. If he'd have been mugged, he would have he would have put up resistance because he was that sort of guy. He wouldn't have he would have you know fought back. Yes. Therefore, being bashed over the head. Um, yes. Well, in fact, I, I do hear these little anecdotes from time to time of. Uh, people, whether it's on Koh Tao or the neighbouring island of Koh Phangang, and a lot of people are interrelated between the two islands. Yeah, but you, you'll have stories of you know two Thai men getting into an argument. One person says to the other, um, "Fuck you" or "Fuck your mother," and then the person who's received the insult walks away, comes back five minutes later with a pistol, and shoots the uh, other fellow dead in front of a huge crowd of people. And the whole thing just, you know, payments are made to the police. No one's ever charged. No one ever goes to court. And the witnesses all just tend to think, well, uh, the fellow who dished out the insult had it coming. It doesn't really take a lot for one person to murder another on these islands. They are very, um, there are some very violent communities uh, behind all of the smiles there. So look, I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, yes, I just thought I'd put those two cents worth in. Um, okay, so you left the island, and now a lot of people who are watching this are going to ask questions like, well, okay, if all of this supposedly happened back in 2000, why didn't um, Mick Locke uh, make a big fuss with either the British police or the British media on his return to England? So what, what's your answer to them? Um, well, uh, Ian was a really popular guy. Um, his friends held a wake for him in Bristol, massive. Yes event Hundred, hundreds of people turned up including his parents i uh, i was still in asia so i didn't go but on returning to england the the consensus was that the parents believed didn't the people the consensus was the parents didn't want people to interfere or to make a fuss that they believed the accident story the story that it was an accident and fallen in the well um and therefore we decided out of respect for them that we would not take it any further we had friends in thailand who said that they would they could report it would you know 
get stories in the Bangkok Post or whatever. But we decided not to follow that up. And for 15, 16 years since then, yes, I've left it live for that very reason. Yes. Um, it was only several years ago. Uh, I was going on holiday to Scotland. She lives five minutes from the airport. I mean, basically, I've, ne I've never met. I had never met his parents, but we used to send each other Christmas cards yes. after we didn't die. That was the only contact we had. Yes. Um, but I, I'd never met them. His father then died. Um, I was flying to Scotland. I decided I'd pop in and see her. She said, yeah, great. I popped in. I wasn't, again, I wasn't going to really bring up the subject, but we got talking. Um, and eventually I said, what happened? What do you think happened to Ian? She said, oh, he was murdered. Straight away, matter of fact. Okay. Uh, um, so then I said, okay, well, that's what we all think. Do you mind if the story gets publicised? She said, no, absolutely not. You go ahead. So from that point onwards, I've been talking to you about it. Um, I got in touch with Tom Stone, who made the Death in Paradise documentary. I mean, a lot oh, of it all came... It was actually, the, that was called Murder in Paradise. That was Murder a Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, to be honest, a lot of this all came back to light after Hannah and David got murdered because yes. it became an issue. Yes. And it only then I started discovering about how many other people had met mysterious deaths in Koh Tao. And even though I know nothing, justice will never be served. It seems relevant to bring it up, really. I mean, I, I, I felt bad that the story about Ian had been buried all these years. Yes. So I'm quite happy for it to be publicised, just mm. so that, you know, he was murdered. Yeah. Because he was. Well, in fact, just for a bit of a more of a timeline for the viewers, uh, I've got a record that on the 17th of May 2016, uh, you sent me a direct message through my Twitter feed and that for some weeks before then, uh, you had been leaving little notes under some of my tweets. So uh, that's uh, about the time that you and I have been in contact with each other. And I, I largely sat on the story until uh, you spoke to his mother. And then uh, on the 20th anniversary of uh, Ian Jacob's death, I created this little video here. And I'll put a link to this below, but um, I listed 18 people who had perished on Koh uh, Tao. And the first in this chronological list was uh, Ian Jacobs. And his picture's about to come up now. Hopefully this won't be too blurry, but I'll put a link to this beneath uh, this video in the description below. So that gives a bit more of a timeline. And uh, it seems that uh, since I published that, which was a year and a, well, that was the beginning of 2000, so a year and a half ago now, you've actually found out a bit more information and you've received some documents from Ian's parents. Is that right? I've now received all the police reports, which I haven't seen before yet. Yeah. I have them here with now, uh, autopsy reports. Yes. Um, witness statements. And I've looked at them closely and it only increases my feelings that he um, was murdered. There yeah. are two or the start is, well, let's go back to one thing I've also discovered um, it recently within the last year is that the story about him being found in a well with water in it and him drowning is not true. Um, mm -hmm. I've since spoken to an, a witness, an eyewitness who saw his body when it was found, the date it was found. Um, I think it was the 18th of January, according to the police reports. And he was not found in a well. He was found in, well, what we think of is a deserted well mm -hmm. with no water in it, full of mud up to pretty much ground level. And I believe this well, the two wells are close together. I was shown the one with water in it. He was found in the dry well. So the idea that he drowned, which is what the police autopsy report says, I now believe to be um, complete fiction. Um, the police reports give me two autopsies. There's the autopsy from Copangang, which says he drowned. There's another autopsy report from Bangkok when his body arrived in Bangkok, which says he died from a blow to the head um, and internal bleeding in the brain. No mention in the police and uh, the autopsy report from Bangkok of water, which is strange if a body had been found in water for three days, according to the police report. Um, you think it would be mentioned. They 
so where the autopsy from Copan Gang says the body was bloated, the body was swollen, the hair was falling out because it had been in water for three days. Bangkok autopsy report doesn't mention water at all. So whatever the cause of death, you think that would be mentioned. It's not. Um, and, and the witness statements, uh, if I could just read out some of the witness statements. This is what makes me, you know, it's suspicious. So the witnesses um, all pretty much say exactly the same thing, which is somewhat suspicious. The, the police officer in charge says, it's believed that the cause of death was most likely because the tourist lost his way or on his way to urinate and happens to fall down into the well and his head hit the mouth of the well before falling into the well, the cause of death, okay? Second witness says, I believe the cause of death was that the man was drunk on his way to urinate. The edge of the well was low. The man didn't notice it and fell into the well. It's most likely he couldn't climb up since he's drunk and finally dead. Next witness believed that the cause of the death was because the man was drunk and on his way to urinate, but unfortunately fell into the well, dug by villagers and died. The next witness, cause of death was likely from drinking liquor and drunk. Villagers saw him drunk and most villagers believed the man got drunk and fell into the well, unable to climb up and lost his life. And the final witness says, uh, believed that the man drunk liquor and got drunk and fell into the well, dug by villagers to consume water in the dry season. The well is quite deep. The man fell into the well and was able to, unable to climb up and finally lost his life. Now, these aren't witnesses that saw anything. Uh, one is um, the owner of the bungalow where he's staying. Yes. One is a taxi driver that um, almost gave him a lift home the night before. One is the guy that found the body. One is the police chief. And yet they all seem to come out in their independent ways by saying sentences that are almost identical yeah. <laughs> that he was drunk and he went to urinate now how anyone could know that when they weren't even there is suspicious mm. let's say and i think that, very... you, that one of the police reports mentioned that he died from a blow to the head uh so the 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 autopsy from copan gang says that he had he died from drowning Yes. But he had a broken neck. Yes. Um, and they're saying probably from hitting something on the way. So they're trying to claim that he fell into the well and hit his head on the way down. And that is why uh, he had a broken neck. The police report in Bangkok just says he died from a blow to the head, bleeding in the brain due to severe impacts at the head. Okay. According to the actual words. Yeah, I've got in front of me. Yeah. Well, look, thanks very much for all of that, um, Mick. I think that uh, that's been uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, one of the things I was just going to mention before uh, we uh, come to the end of the interview is that uh, quite often we have a lot of trolls who watch my channel, uh, trolls who watch my um, Twitter feed, which is Ian Yarwood underscore law, and trolls who watch my or read my Facebook page, which is uh, Koh Tao Death Island and those trolls will say things like oh if this happened uh, 21 years ago it's old news why are you mentioning it now and one of the things which I just wanted to highlight is that quite often within the mainstream media both in Thailand and in Britain uh, a lot of the murders and suspicious deaths are completely overlooked so a lot of the crime is understated secondly uh, there was a well-known journalist who was the head of the BBC in Bangkok. His name was Jonathan Head. And immediately after the murders of Hannah and David, he went to Koh Tao and he sent out a couple of uh, television reports. And in, one of his comments from there was uh, he referred to Koh Tao as this normally peaceful island. And he made a couple of other comments that were similar. Uh, now, Jonathan Head had made, uh, he did make a, a, a very good uh, article, or he wrote a very good article on the day that the two Burmese men were convicted of the murders of Hannah and David. But I've often found when I look at reports uh, from the mainstream media that they paint Koh Tao as being, um, you, know, you know, heaven on earth. And in fact, I think that anyone who's paid any attention would know that Koh Tao uh, can be heaven or it can be hell. 
and anyone who thinks otherwise uh, really is not paying attention. And so, you know, when we've got uh, people like Mick coming forward, as he has kindly done so today, and told us the story about Ian Jacob's death, you know, we can piece that together with the assassination of Vera Asavachan uh, in 2002. He was known as Mr. Ban, and he created Ban's Diving Resort and Ban's Diving School. And he was assassinated by a lone gunman wearing a balaclava. He was shot six times on Sairi Beach as he was chatting with three friends. And that's reported in the Bangkok Post. Then obviously, of course, we had the uh, murders of uh, Ben Harrington uh, in 2012 and Nick Pearson a short time later. And all of that was before the deaths of Hannah and David. And there were lots of other little anecdotes floating around that the mainstream media didn't always pick up. And of course, in recent weeks, I've um, published two videos on this channel uh, in which I've interviewed Carla Bartel and Sam Venning, who escaped two masked men, <clears throat> excuse me, who attacked them in the very same spot where the bodies of Hannah and David were found. So in answer to all of the trolls who might be asking, um, there are very good reasons why we have uh, Mick Locke coming on the um, channel today to explain what happened uh, 21 years ago. Uh, so look, I thank you again for your time, Mick. And is there anything else you'd like to add or is there anything else that's come to your attention or come to mind as you've been um, speaking today? No, I think that's just about covered it. I'm happy with that. Okay. Look, well, no, I, don't have, I don't have a grudge against Kotao. I just like to make that plain. Um, things happen everywhere in the world. Yes. This is no better against Death Island, but yes. my best mate got killed. And yeah. I want it, the truth to be known. That's basically, yes. that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think you've done everyone a great service by coming forward. And uh, I, and I think a lot of people will understand that uh, you kept a lid on things for a while, especially when you thought that um, uh, Ian's parents were of the belief that perhaps he did die in an accident and you didn't want to unduly upset them. So, exactly. Yeah. I didn't want to be the one that told them that you know, no. their son had yeah. been murdered. Yeah. Could have ruined the rest of their lives. Yes. Well, thank you. Well, thank you again for your time. And uh, look, for all the viewers out there, if you've uh, appreciated um, uh, Mick's interview, please give the video a thumbs up. It does help uh, this YouTube channel and it's just a sign of appreciation for Mick as well. I'm sure he would appreciate it. And, uh, you know, just in, in memory of uh, poor Ian Jacobs, whose life was cut short because he was only 35 years old at the time. Um, so uh, look, thank you again. And uh, please, consider subscribing and leaving any comments. Thanks again, Mick, and you, you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks. Cheers, Ian. Cheers. Bye for now.